first technical meeting, which we decided we'd do as a, as a, in a Zoom format uh, to give it a go. We're doing a bit of a hybrid uh, season this time where we've got some uh, actually being held at Books and Rugby Club and this one's kicking us off. Um, thanks to Patrick for Oles for organising this and many thanks to Andy for doing the presentation. Andy's going to talk to us about uh, a bit of background to the regulations, but mainly about regulation six and eight of the Quarry Regs 1999. So again, thanks again for tuning in and over to you, Andy. Thank you. Thanks, uh, John. Thank you very much. Um, just uh, before we start, uh, just a, a first question for everybody. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Those of you who are on camera, if you could give me a thumbs up that you can hear me, that would be great. And I'll just trust the people who've got the cameras off can as it is. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, so uh, just to give you a, a bit of an overview about myself, really, before I start. Uh, my name is Andy. I've been in the industry for in excess for 20 years. Uh, I've had quite a varied and uh, quite, uh, I guess, unique uh, taste of the industry because I've gone from uh, working in, in the quarry and uh, labouring in the quarry to operating plant, and the wide variety of plant, and then taken on a training role. Uh, that then uh, sort of evolved into me being uh, sort of uh, moved into a logistics side and taken on a logistics side from uh, and looking at it from, a, from a, even a different angle. So I've got quite a, a broad range of it uh, and then uh, certainly for the last four and a half years, I've been uh, now at MPQC uh, doing training uh, from all the way from apprentices all the way through to uh, quarry managers and, and, and senior managers and things. So that's a, a little bit of a, a background about me. Um, the way uh, what I'm planning on doing is just taking you through a couple of regulations as we would present them on uh, pretty much on a training course as as such and then go into a little bit more depth on that. Uh, now, when I do uh, present training courses, one of the things I do uh, like to do is make them uh, interactive. Uh, and that means interactive means that you're not gonna just sit there and uh, listen to me uh, read the slides. I mean, I can sit here and read the slides for you, but I, I can tell you it'd just be a waste of your time and uh, you're not gonna get anything out of that. The best way to get the most out of these sort of uh, sessions is if people get involved, share experiences and share their stories. So uh, yeah, so I, I am going to expect some sort of interaction uh, or you will be bored to tears in, in the, the next five, 10 minutes, that's for sure. Um, so let me just share my slide with you. And there you go. I'm now hoping that everybody uh, can see my slide in front of them. If you, can, if you can see it and you're on camera, could you just give me a thumbs up to show me that you can see it? Excellent, well, I'll just, uh, I'll just uh, take that as uh, everybody else can see it as well. Thank you, everybody. Um, so what we're going to look at today uh, in terms of the, the regulations, well, first of all, uh, the first part of it, I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes just going through a brief uh, look at the regulations and how they came into force and how regulations happened. Uh, then after that, we'll have a look at regulation six and uh, find out who's responsible for most of the duties in the regulations book and how the people who are responsible for it, how they, how they are uh, sort of challenged to meet those responsibilities. And then we're gonna have a look at the management structure and what the requirements are for the safe running of a quarry, uh, at, you know, from the management uh, side of it. So uh, my first uh, piece of interaction is, and uh, this is a challenge to, to you, is can anybody uh, tell me how long uh, they think that quarrying has been an occupation Anybody give me a, an answer to that? And I'll take that from anybody before I, I'll go around and randomly ask people to, to, to tell me anybody. And there's no right or wrong answers to this, just what you think. Anybody? Since the Stone Age. Since the Stone Age, Andy. Cheers, John. Since the Stone Age, absolutely. Um, and uh, I'm not gonna, I, there's, I'm not mentioning anything about most of the quarry managers coming from the Stone Age either, John. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Quarrying has been uh, since early man. I mean, it's been since uh, we've been digging for flints and chipping them into shapes for tools and things like that. Absolutely. So uh, quarrying has, uh, you know, had quite, quite a long history. However, regulations aren't that long or that old in the tooth. Regulations actually, uh, came into force. Well, actually, is a, is a question for you. Does anybody know when the first set of regulations came in uh, to force? Anybody 
off the top of their heads a, a gamble. Anybody like to have a guess when regulations first came in? 54. Oh, I'll tell you what, that's not a bad shout, John. Yeah, so we're talking about the 1954 Act. It's not a bad shout. Uh, the actual first set of regulations actually do uh, first get mentioned in the Factories Act in, 19, in 1878. Uh, however, uh, that was any place not being a mine, and it was, it, it, yes, yeah, it's, it's a J. However, the first attempt to sort of bring it into any real control was, um, yeah, the first, the, the first attempt to bring it in any, in, uh, any control was 1895, uh, where they concentrated on quarries over 20 feet deep at the time. Uh, at the time, uh, there, there was, uh, in, in 1895, there are 105,000 people employed in quarries, uh, in 8,000 quarries, and it was producing circa 30 million tonnes in the UK in, in that year. Um, so part of the regulations talked about uh, reporting of, of serious injuries and fatalities as well, and this was part of the control, if you like. Uh, in the 10 years after the 1894 Act um, it came into place, uh, there was 1,150 people were killed and 12,000 people seriously injured in quarries. Now, I, I have to say that I think, and I'm not alone in thinking this, that there was some serious underreporting in those 10 years, if you can imagine the, uh, the, the sort of activities people were getting up to uh, back then. Um, also, in the 10 years after the quarry regulations came into force, there were 500 prosecutions against um, uh, owners, and there was a hundred prosecutions against people who worked in quarries. Uh, the average fine uh, was 15 shillings per person who worked in a quarry uh, uh, in, the, in those 10 years. So uh, the real control of getting into, the, into quarries, uh, it, you can imagine it wasn't well received at the time, uh, if you like. Um, the challenge of the uh, 1984 Act uh, really looked at, uh, you know, several things, really blasting how people got in and out of the quarry, the machinery and plant for the quarry, the duty of people, who, uh, the officials who work in quarry and uh, ambulancemen and the, and the workmen as well. Um, in 1906, King Edward VII uh, commissioned a medal. It was first awarded in 1907 to a guy called uh, William Roberts of Dorothea Quarry in Wales. Uh, for gallantry, uh, and it was a it was a, uh, a gallantry medal for mines and quarries, specifically for people who worked in it. Uh, and uh, um, what happened with William Roberts is he he was uh, uh, brave enough to save a colleague's uh, life, so he was awarded the gallantry medal. Um, Nineteen fourteen, seen a report uh, written where, in nineteen fourteen, recommendations were made, or several recommendations, uh, such things as the age of quarry managers uh, not being younger than twenty five, and also talking about facilities uh, such as mess rooms and uh, recommendations of respirators were also drawn up uh, as well in, in in and around that time. Uh, in 1938, all quarries were brought under the Quarries Act, uh, regardless of depth, and, uh, and uh, so they were all incorporated into the Quarries Act. And then, of course, uh, as John has mentioned already, that we had the 1954 Act, uh, which was des uh, designed to simplify the Act that was, uh, you know, uh, set out in 1894 or the 1895 Act, if you like. So the law relating to South Health, Safety and Mines Quarries, and that was really the precursor to what we see today is uh, Health and Safety at Quarries and, and, the, and the book that I'm sure that you'll all be familiar with, uh, which is uh, sets out uh, about, um, it, yeah, it sort of falls into line better with the uh, Health and Safety at Work Act. It, re it aligns with it uh, and it talks about reasonably practical or, or, it, or it allows for reasonably practical, which of course falls into the Health and Safety at Work Act. Also, um, things around uh, the, the health and safety of quarries here it certainly helped things where uh, that there was a lot more workforce in, engagement if you like uh, which ties into the health and safety work act when you look at um, the, the, the the sort of Robin's report on the Swedish workers reform policies where there was a lot more input required from the people who work uh, whether it be in quarries or any workplace really and so the the, the, the um, um, 
Quo Regs 99 uh, came into force. They came into force on the 1st of January uh, 2000. So there's a little bit of a brief history. So quarry regs have sort of evolved over time and, and, and the, the, the things that have been added over time. Certainly uh, things like uh, TIPS regulations weren't involved in the 54 Act of regulations. They came in uh, as part of, a, a, you know, because they, they were written as a TIPS regulations in, in 1969 after the Abba Fan disaster, but then came in and were, were added into the 99 regulations, uh, if, if you like. So, uh, so there's a, a brief history. Uh, it will lead us now onto the person who uh, is in, in, in charge, I guess, or in, in who's given most responsibilities of the quarry regs, uh, which is the operator, which we uh, look at under regulation six of the um, regulations. Um, regulation six does state that most of the duties uh, of, of, the, uh, of the regulations fall onto the operator and when we talk about the operator, uh, the operator in a quarry means the person in overall control of the quarry and the working of the quarry. Now, the term person is a legal term. It can mean individual and it can mean a company. And normally it is a, uh, it is a, um, a company who is, the, who is the operator, if you like. Now, there are six uh, key duties for the operator to ensure that the quarry and its plant are, um, are safe or run safely. Um, six key duties and the operator's got to ensure that the, the, the uh, quarry uh, undertake these, uh, or sorry, he undertakes these uh, six things about the quarry. Can everybody have a guess what the six things that the operator's got to ensure? And, and if you are struggling, I will give you the first one to, to start you off. So the operator's got to ensure that the quarry is and, and, and its plant are designed correctly. So what else do you think the quarry operator has got to ensure? Point of management, management structure. structure. Well, absolutely. And, that, and that's a really good one. Uh, and that does fall into sort of one of the major headings, uh, John, so excellent. So they have to appoint a management structure, absolutely. So uh, excellent, thanks, John. Uh, what other were the, the, the six duties that the operator has got to ensure? Competent workforce. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So a competent workforce. Yeah. So that's sort of that's brilliant, Pat, because that falls into line with John's point of management structure, because the heading really that they fall under there is operated. So the quarry operator has got to make sure that the quarry is designed correctly. It's operated correctly. What else do you think they've got to ensure? We've got to have written, written schemes. Yeah, well, yeah, we could talk about written schemes, uh, John. Just, just, just elaborate a little bit on that for me. We're, well, for, for inspection and, uh, and operation, and you know, and then design and an operation. Uh, excellent, right? So, yeah, so brilliant. So uh, that written scheme that would fall under certainly under one of the, one of the other headings there that we got. So we've got the design, we've got operated and maintained. So maintained by making sure that it's inspected, maintained correctly, and and, and, and operate correctly. Excellent, thank you, John, brilliant, uh, great answer. What else, anybody else got anything? Anybody else as we... Uh... Okay, right. Okay, well, I'll, I, I can add the others for you. Uh, so the, uh, so the, other th the other three are that the, the operator certainly uh, to ensure that the quarry and its plant are designed, constructed, equipped, commissioned, operated, and maintained correctly. And so they're the, they're the real uh, sort of headline acts, if you like, okay? Now, uh, Regulation 6 states that the distinctive and key duty of the operator is to manage the quarry safely uh, and, uh, and manage the health and safety for the whole site, including any work quarry carried out by uh, contractors. Uh, but operators, however, have the overall responsibility for coordinating and overseeing uh, the work. Yeah? Um, the operator, when we talk about uh, sort of uh, constructed, we can talk about buildings and man-made structures in the quarry. Uh, so as we talk, uh, things like hoppers and storage bins and conveyor systems, they need to be designed and uh, constructed to uh, proper structural standards. Uh, unless there are other things in play that mean that a higher standard is required, but as a minimum, that's what they would need to be doing. Uh, and uh, again, when we go, we can come around to, to making sure the equipment's right for the, for the job it's supposed to do, 
uh, it's signed off, commissioned right, uh, it's operated and uh, run correctly, is, is what we said there, through our management structure, our competent workforce, and then, of course, uh, the maintenance of the quarry and, and make sure it's maintained through things like our uh, written scheme, as John quite rightly said, under Regulation 12, and also uh, making sure uh, that the that, that it's um, building and plants instructions are, are maintained as well, so that everybody is 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 safe. Okay, so there's our main headline act. However, now I'm going to put a challenge to you. Okay, so let's say that we all get together and say, right, we're going to open a quarry. Okay, we're, we're going to we're going to become a quarry operator. We're going to become Acme Quarries. Uh, we're going to get a big piece of land, uh, and uh, we, we we we've sourced the land. And what we're going to do is we're going to excavate it and uh, and and. and and sort of turn it into a quarry. Now, to ensure that we need uh, that we uh, undertake these activities and we fall into line with these six activities, there are there are key things that would make sure that we do, uh, or key activities that we do that would fall under these six headings, if you like. So, uh, what I would what I would like to do is, what what do you think are some of the things that the operator would need to consider to make sure that they, that they meet the duty? So, as an operator. What would we need to consider for our big field to make sure that we meet the duty of uh, uh, making sure that the quarry's de uh, designed, constructed, uh, and, uh, and maintained and, and operated correctly and, and all that? What, what do you think some of the things are? And I'll take it from anybody. Okay. I, 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 don't you, I, don't. Don't you have to let the HSC know that you are you have an intent to operate or something like that? Well, certainly, yeah, we would certainly need to, yeah we would certainly need to notify the HSC that the that the quarry is a it, 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 we're going to turn a, a piece of land into a quarry. Absolutely, uh, we would need to let them know a number of things, uh, John. On that, we would need to let them know uh, certainly who the operator of the quarry is. Uh, we would need to let them know the address and telephone number of the of the quarry. Uh, I think the regulations still state that you should give them a fax uh, number for the quarry. However, I'm, I'm, I'm quite convinced that they wouldn't expect a fax number now that it's certainly email contacts and things like that, but they would need an ordnance grid survey a reference number. Uh, and yeah, and, and you know, basically what the quarry is going to, what the quarry is going to operate, what it's going to, uh, what you're going to quarry out of it and, and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, a lot of, information of the, uh, around the quarry certainly we'd need to let the HSE know so excellent John so that would certainly fall under one of the things that we would certainly need to do what else will we need to consider as, as operating our quarry what, what do we need to consider um, Fati, Fati here would we uh, we would need a site management plan to start yeah. with everything yeah okay excellent so we would need to make sure that we got a, a, a site management and a, a plan so um, cheers uh, Fatty. a uh, great answer yeah so we would need to make sure that that's in place wouldn't we so our management uh, structure and plan excellent thank you we need a design obviously a design of, of how we're going to operate the quarry and, and, and how it's going to be laid out excellent Stephen yeah brilliant we would certainly need a design of, of how it's going to operate and, and how it's going to be laid out a absolutely so that would be one of one of the things as well excellent cheers Stephen what else will we need anybody planning permission so sorry John sorry. planning permission yeah, certainly planning permission. I think that would go in with uh, certainly with our with, with parts of the notifications we'd have to give to the HSE and the local authorities and, and councils and things like that. But certainly well, that would that would probably include your design as well, wouldn't it? They'd want to see what you're actually going to do. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, your design would go into the planning permission, and and, and of course, your, your design, your quarry design, would be something that you would uh, uh, maybe furnish the HSE with as well, especially the, the original design. Yeah. So, yeah. Excellent. Safety Thank management you. plan, uh, safety yeah. plan for the whole site. Yeah, okay, traffic yeah, management I, plan. All these management plans for the site, maybe. Yeah. So when you say talk about a safety management plan, are we talking about some sort of emergency response plan, that type of thing? Fatty is. Would include what? that as well. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So so emergency response plans and safety management plans. So how we're going to manage health and safety? I think that would sort of certainly tie into. Uh, the, the management structure side of it as well. So excellent, thank you, Fatih. Uh, anybody else? Any, any any others? What else will we need to consider? Quarry document. 
Yeah, oh yeah, so we need to make sure we got uh, yeah the, the health and safety document in place. Uh, uh, Pat, excellent, thank you. So uh, a really good, important one. Um, what else will we need to uh, consider on that as part of our uh, part of our quarry? Just technical oh. appraisal, and then maybe. Uh, right, yeah, brilliant. So I've got. I, I think who was the geotech? Who's the geotechnical appraisal? Was that Stephen? Excellent, yes. Stephen. Yeah, great answer. Yeah. So we would need to make sure uh, we got a geotechnical appraisal on on, on the site yeah, and know what we're doing. Excellent. Well done. Uh, somebody else say something as well at the same time. Anybody else? No. We need some money, won't we? <laughs> yeah, because. Because it's not going to be cheap, is it? What would we? What would you spend our money on, John? What, what would you, what... Well, again, you you you're probably going to have to put a bond up with whoever gives you the planning permission these days. They're not going to mm -hmm. let you just go in there and uh, and dig up the ground without that. I wouldn't have thought. Yeah. But then you then you you're going to have you're going to have to employ some um, specialists in their fields, sort of geotechnical experts. Yeah. To start with, because uh, you need you need to get any design signed off. Yeah, um, we we may have him within our group, of course, but you still I think you'd still need an external body to look at it. Right. Okay. Um, so uh, I, again, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't know too much about the, the so familiar with the planning uh, with local councils and things like that. Uh, no, I mean, like, for the geotechnical assessment, yeah, that's yeah. Um, we, we could write our own, I guess, between us. We'd have we'd probably have enough. Uh, knowledge and experience to do that, but uh, aren't, aren't we supposed to get that signed off by a uh, by a consultant? Well, so the, a geotechnical specialist would be able to give us a geotechnical a geotechnical special uh, sorry a geotechnical assessment uh, is done by a geotechnical specialist who has uh, you know got uh, there is prescription of what a geotechnical specialist is with uh, qualification in rock and soil mechanics and uh, a practical experience in the industry. Now, if there's anybody in the on the call here who's a geotechnical specialist, then um, I, I would, unless they would tell me any different, uh, that they would be able to uh, uh, sign that uh, sign that off as a geotechnical uh, yeah, as a geotechnical yeah. assessment. Is that right, Stephen? Is it? Hi, Andy. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I'm a geotech specialist. Yes. Yeah, so. Um... Yeah, basically the assessment would need to be in place, and and I've done them both in house and as a consultant. So yeah, yeah, with you on that one. But you, but you'd yeah. be able to do it for us as a part of our group Acme quarries. You could do our geotechnical because you could be our geotechnical specialist, couldn't you? Indeed, yeah, no problem. Jo job's yours if you want it, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the one thing is on geotech specialists, you're appointed as well, so it does carry a lot of personal weight as well. Because I think if there's a geotech issue, then the specialist yeah. could be on the stand as well as the operator so yeah 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 absolutely yeah 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 because you're, you're the one signing off and, and especially when it comes to things like significant hazards and stuff like that and you know what i mean exactly. it's your neck you're, you're putting your neck on the line as well aren't you exactly exactly yeah okay cheers steam thank you uh Sorry. excellent so uh so excellent so so we've now got our big pot of money and and and, and we can save on a geotechnical specialist because steam is going to do it for us so uh what what um what else are we going to spend our money on? A big pot of money that we need. What else? Would we need a um, legally sort of appointed person that's, you know, ticketed um, like the quarry manager? I don't know how the group is, like, you know, but... Um, <laughs> again, I, I wouldn't say it would be one of the key... It's not certainly one of the key things that is, is stipulated in the regulations, Patty. Uh, however, if we were... Quarry manager, you know. Yeah, if we were going to set up a business, I would, I would certainly suggest that we might do that. Um, but certainly, I was like more aiming to what the, the the regulations say that the operator needs to consider uh, some of the things they need to consider. So uh, things like certainly a geotechnical, uh, you know, the geotechnical features of the site would be a thing that the operator would need to consider, or we need to consider. Um, so, but it's a good answer if we were if, if we were looking at a wider scale uh, of it rather than just the operator. What else would we need to consider, anybody? We need some plant, Andy. Ah, right, Pat. Yeah, because we like at the moment we've got nothing, have we? We're going to dig with our hands. Now, and, and, and listen, 
And I, I don't know what you're like in Derbyshire, but where I'm from, that's not a very comfortable thing to be doing with you, especially. Um, uh, so yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. We we need some plant, won't we? Some plant and machinery and, and and stuff like that. What plant are we going to have in the quarry would certainly be a, a consideration. Uh, for, so make sure we got the right plant, the right job, wouldn't we? Excellent. Cheers, Pat. Excellent. What else will we need to consider? Anybody? Well, would it have to be a, a restoration scheme as well? Ah, right. Okay. So now we're sort of moving on. Yeah, but I, yeah, I, I would suggest that that would certainly be uh, one of the things that the operator must consider is, is how we're going to leave the quarry afterwards. I think that goes into uh, so much of one one of the responsibilities. Uh, on how yeah how we leave it how we abandon it if we are going to if we do abandon the, the the quarry excellent pat um a restoration scheme would certainly be be a, a, a key wouldn't it yeah something with training uh would we need a training department to assess you know everyone coming to sites operators yeah yeah certainly we we, we, we documentation would, yeah uh, yeah again we would certainly need to make sure that we've got our our our, our workforce trained and, and they're competent for the jobs that they're going to do certainly or uh, because the regulations state that everybody who works in a quarry must be competent or under the supervision of a competent person so excellent fatty uh, yeah excellent uh, any, any others any, anything else have we got i mean there's a whole host of things out there we need to consider what do you consider about your quarries what, what are some of the things what are the day-to-day -day activities that you need to think in your quarries that happen Oh, okay, right, okay. I won't, uh, I, I won't torture anybody by dragging them on here unwillingly. Um, so what I would say, say is there are a number of key things that the regulations state that the operator must do to meet those, uh, to meet their duty. Uh, and there's nine uh, things that they break it down into nine things that we need to, con we need to consider as an operator. First of all, uh, the geotechnical features of the site, as uh, Stephen and, and uh, as, as rightly has been pointed out, that we would need geotechnical assessments and, and, and uh, geotechnical features of the site. Also, uh, the homes and footpaths and schools and bridleways and other areas where uh, public are likely to be found, uh, including any future uh, planning de uh, decisions or departments as well uh, that might be coming. The presence of any water courses or, uh, uh, or services, particularly any overhead uh, electrical power lines and such. So we, we need to be uh, in consideration of that uh, and, and include in old mine workings and, and things. Yeah. The use of uh, traffic routes, the, the width of traffic routes, uh, take into account pedestrian safety and uh, types of mobile plant that we're going to use on those traffic routes would be a, a consideration. Uh, where we put our buildings and tips, uh, including stockpiles, need to consider where we're going to stick our lagoons and where we're going to put our, our structures and how we're going to build them to make sure that they're stable. The materials that we're going to work, we're working uh, things maybe with high silica contents and stuff like that. Uh, we need to consider that, that uh, as well as how we're going to work the, 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 the material, how we're going to uh, get, get it out. Um, as uh, Pat like you said, the plant that we need, fixed or mobile as well, would be a consideration to make sure that we meet the regulation, as well as the safe use and maintenance of plant uh, and machinery. Uh, and then finally, uh, the safe use of explosives. So when you uh, consider those are the things that the operator needs to, uh, to, to, uh, to consider. And if you have a look at the list that you've, you've given me, so we talk about the management structure and things like that, well, uh, we can look at that and say, well, that's where we come to the safe use and maintenance of whether a plant or whether you use the safe use of plant or, you know, you know, we can put that in the management structure because that's how it's used, because they manage the, the, the way that's used. So this is uh, really a, a, a key, um, you know, key nine areas that the operator needs to consider as, as part of their thing. However, there are some other critical areas that we really need to think about as well as operators. And tragically, we've got to think about things like this. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, things where there are public safety implications. Um, you know, if we, but uh, I mean, if you have a look at the list that we had on the nine points, there's many public safety implications to a lot of those. 
uh, but we need to think about um, the way we work the quarry and the the uh, the risk that it may uh, create create to the public um, and, and things like that. So precautions need to be uh, uh, put in place. Now, if we've got uh, things like if we've got things like bridleways and pathways and footways through quarries, then we need to make sure that they're risk assessed uh, and the route uh, around it is risk assessed and, um, and, and that is regularly reviewed. However, it's always best to reroute any uh, public rights away around quarries and, and, and ensure that you've got them uh, around quarries. What uh, I, I'd ask is, uh, and again, I, I, I'd like some, some, maybe some input from you guys and, and girls on here. Is if you could tell me, do any of you have issues with trespassers in in your quarries? Anybody with uh, any any sort of issues that you get? Would you like to share anything? <coughs> Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a while ago now, but one of the quarries I was manager of, I didn't think I had an issue, but then went on to YouTube and I most definitely did. So you find that people tend to put things on social media. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so you found out through look, looking through social media or whatever that, that you've got an issue in your quarry. Okay. Yeah. But, and what did you have to do about it, Pat? What was it? What was, how did you? Well, we just, we had to, uh, basically we had to, we had to up the security so we had to spend more money on security just to keep people out people were swimming in the lagoons people were fishing you know predominantly over the weekends and then you've got um our friends at like electrical cable so yeah. you know it, it, we had to put full-time security on yeah did it stop it pat or did it just to my it? knowledge yeah right yeah. okay it was expensive yeah, I bet. Yeah, yeah. Just to keep it, keep people safe, trying to keep people safe from from, from their own activities. Like, yeah. um, a, a, anybody else? Any, any, any sharing? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think most people at some point will have issues with the, you know, trespasses in quarries, even if you've got no public rights away. Um, but you know, my advice from that really is is obviously regular inspection, but more importantly, you know, plenty of photographs that you have repaired items that have uh, got damaged or somebody's cut wire into, or, 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 or fences, etc., such that you can actually prove that there is regular inspection and that you are doing something about it. Yeah, and that's a really good point there, Stephen. Um, one of the best practices I heard was um, actually from uh, from the the lads at Mount Sorrel Quarry. Uh, and what they do uh, there is that they do their fence inspections with a GoPro camera and they film uh, the, 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 uh, the, the fence inspection and then log any, uh, any, any sort of uh, any issues with the fence under what three words as well so that they can, you know, pinpoint, it, you know, to, 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 to uh, quite an exact, um, an exact um, location if you like um however it does lead me to share with you the story of uh, the lad who uh, carried out and uh, uh, he, and he was telling me the um that he was carrying out a, an inspection uh, it, it, on one of the phases at mount sorrel quarry with the gopro camera and there was a bridge that had closed the road so, so the bridge had been down quite a while the road had been if, if you know mount, mount sorrel the, the, the road had been closed uh, for quite a considerable amount of time and as he was going up to do his uh, face inspection uh, he uh, came across a car that was parked there and uh, the car was parked there and as he got there there were um, three naked people uh, all with their trainers on one woman and two guys and they were uh, yeah and uh, he uh, managed to disturb them doing what they were doing and, and they managed to skedaddle out there um, but apparently it's all on GoPro camera so if you ever get to Mount Sorrel Quarry and anybody's interested that's to that's to see the uh, fence inspection for Mount Sorrel Quarry uh, if, if you're interested. Um, but yeah, so yeah, absolutely. So pictures, Stephen, are absolutely uh, critical, I think, to, to show that you are doing inspections and, and that you, you, you're getting them right. Um, a couple of uh, stories that, that like, I, I 
tell you on the, the seriousness of that it's being taken is the uh, is the fatality uh, a, a couple of years ago at WH Malcolm, uh, which was is a WH Malcolm or a big logistics company. And just to give you the sort of size of what what can happen is um, they had an incident where a uh, weekend there were two nine year old boys playing football outside the uh, fence at, at their um, of their uh, outside their their, their their railhead in rugby and uh, the ball went over the fence the two nine-year-old boys climbed over the fence to go and retrieve the ball uh, they then started climbing on top of the rail wagons that were parked there and, and, and left there you know over the weekend and that and uh, unfortunately one of the rail wagons was uh, parked underneath some overhead power cables uh, uh, one of the nine-year-old boys was electrocuted and uh, tragically fatally killed uh, WH Malcolm last year were fined 6.5 million pounds for that. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, because a, the, the kids obviously get an access, but the other thing is, is leaving the, the, the leaving the, the rail carriage where they'd left it underneath the, uh, underneath the power lines, the, the, it was decided that they could have left it anywhere else, but underneath those power lines and, and prevented that from happening. So, you know, even if, we are doing our fence inspections. We have got our fences safe. We still have got a duty to make sure that the quarry is left in a safe condition for trespassers if people do get in, is, 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 the, uh, is the thing. The uh, quarry that you see in front of you here is a quarry in um, Lancashire. Uh, and since uh, 2015, they've had three fatalities in this quarry. Uh, the last one being on the 9th of July uh, this year. Uh, and it's uh, been a well-known spot where people uh, will go and swim. They've even had uh, the fire service sitting outside the quarry in the summer trying to beg people not to go in there, uh, that, you know, and, and then people ignoring them and routinely ignoring them. Um, one of the stories on this is the, 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 the people who own the quarry now, it's a, it's a um, development company, a real estate company, uh, they actually got planning permission to drain uh, with, uh, with, from the local environment agency to drain something like 75% of the water that was in there and, and feed it into a brook. Uh, and, 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 uh, and they were given that sort of permission and, uh, and they were looking at how they do this, but it meant that can, uh, they needed to construct a new road to go to the quarry for HGVs to get there to, to be able to do it. Uh, and planning permission was denied them to construct the road so the water never got drained and, and, and uh, you know and, we, and they're we're tragically losing uh, people in, the, in this here um, and, it, and this quarry is it, you know it's, it's, it's known in, in, in Lancashire of, of a quarry where there are fatalities and, and, and incidents uh, so again uh, not um, yeah ideal um, is, is anybody got anything to add on, on this before I sort of move on around this subject there's, there's just one on that, and maybe there's a, there's a uh, dormant quarry, well, redundant quarry, I guess it is now, near near Buxton, called uh, Hoffman's Quarry. And they've had some similar problems there. People, they, they actually call it the beach. You know, they go and sit on the beach and they go swimming and boating and that. They've, they've actually died. They've had a couple of attempts at dying the water now, black. And it does yeah. put people off from going. Yeah. So it, it's... I don't know if they could work for this location that you've shown us, but you know, if people are aware that uh, uh, others have died in there, they're still going, then you know, what more can you do, really? You, you're, at, you're, at, you're at a loss, aren't you? you yeah, know, like, because everybody thinks that they're a strong swimmer or, or whatever, they don't realize the dangers that are involved no. in it, you know, and and, and and you know, I don't know whether. Uh, you know whether we need to make you know not not just quarrying because it's not just quarries that people are drowning in. I mean they've had a, a terrible year this year with people drowning in lakes, canals, rivers, quarries, or, or whatever. And but uh, you know more public information on it and, and more awareness of, of the dangers of it. You know, so. I think we should, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Excellent. Thank you, John. Thanks for, for adding that. And uh, yeah, and, and I, I guess the beach is that the same one as that they call the Blue Lagoon? Is that the that is the Blue Lagoon? Yeah, 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 yeah. Very normally uh, black now. Yeah, um, I think that the, 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 the real crux in that one came when Instagram celebrities started 
posting selfies of them there and and uh, you know followers and influencers and people i i was talking to some of the lads at some of the quarries out buxton when i've been there and they've they've told me that around buxton you can't get parked on a summer's day Um, travel up from london apparently to to Yeah. Lagoon, yeah. so yeah so in, in, again like you say in your, your neck of the woods yeah so um yeah absolutely yeah the, the uh, um excellent thank you john thanks for that um so th- next uh consideration that the uh, operator needs to consider uh you know they've got to consider the coordination communication and cooperation uh between people um who, uh, who do you think that the operator needs to consider coordination, cooperation and, uh, and uh, communication with? Who, do you, who, who the groups of people you think they need to coordinate and co- cooperate with? Anybody? Workforce? Yeah, so, yeah, so okay, so the employees of the quarry would certainly be uh, somebody they've got to do, wouldn't they? Yeah, so employees. Who else? Who would they need that? To con- Public. Cheers, John. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, the public would be uh, yeah, a, a, a somebody they've got to consider, consider that communication and cooperation with as well. Who else would they need to consider with? Okay, who else do you have working in your quarries? Contractors. Yeah, contractors would certainly be, uh, be one of them. And who else comes into the quarries? Who else do you get in your quarries? Wagon drivers. Wagon drivers, excellent. Yeah, so uh, uh, as tough as it might be, they're the, you know, they're groups of people that they need to, to consider coordination, uh, cooperation, and, uh, and and communication with. Uh, and and that consideration needs to be, uh, you know, from the moment that they, they, they we, you know, from the moment you're bringing people into the quarry to the moment, and, and before then uh, is when the operator needs to uh, consider it. Now irrespective of the duties of the operator under these regulations uh, the contractors themselves do remain responsible for complying with uh, other relevant health and safety legislation uh, and, um, and and if you think of other legislation and regulations the the, the, du- the, the the sort of primary duties under those fall on the, on the, the contractors or, or, or the employer of the self of the contractors or, or the, them themselves um, now, it's not up to the operator to repeat any of the work that's uh, been done by uh, others when they carry out their duties, but the operator nevertheless needs to make sure that they're satisfied that the people that they're bringing on site are, are you know, have got the right things in place and, and that they, they've got the right systems in place to ensure the health and safety of everybody in their quarry. Uh, so if you think like that. Now, I, I always... You know, when we, we, we talk about uh, contractors, drivers and, and, and employees and blasting contractors and people like that, these quite a, we've got quite a range of people that there needs to be a coordination, communication and cooperation with. And, and it's quite, uh, I find it quite, um, I, I guess, uh, quite funny. So when I'm, because when, I, I do a broad range of training, so sometimes I'll have drivers in a classroom and the drivers will moan about everybody in the quarry not understanding what they do and, and the problems of their job. And then I'll go to a group of contractors and the group of contractors, they'll moan about everybody in the quarry not understanding about their job and what they do. And the contractors, if you've got a muck in your, like, like a, 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 you know, a muck shift contractors or you've got a, a group of contractors on the crusher doing that, you know, with a crushing contract, uh, they'll moan uh, predominantly about the blasting contractors. Uh, because they'll say that they don't blast it right enough. And then you talk to the blasting contractors and they moan about the contractors and everybody moans about everybody. Uh, and, and the coordination and cooperation and communication just seems to be a big moan about anybody who's not in your group because uh, there's not an understanding of what everyone does. Um, but again, it, it does lead me to a, a story of a quarry manager who told me that he, he once brought in a group of contractors and uh, as the group of contractors came into his he, into his site, he, um, he he said that what he'd done was that they were they were going to carry out a muck shift job for the extension on the quarry. So he brought them in at six o'clock on a Monday morning so that he can get them all inducted and they were all ready to go uh, when the quarry started at seven o'clock. Uh, and he told me he said everyone knew that they were coming in; it wasn't a big problem. He said there was no big issues. He said, but when the day he brought them in, he said he lost all opportunity and he lost all 
uh, yeah, you know, sort of all power in trying to get the contractors and his employees to work, and the lads from the quarry who, who were employed at the quarry uh, to work and cooperate and coordinate with each other and even communicate with each other. With each other. And he told me the reason why that failed. And, he, and, and as I can tell you, that the reason why it failed, failed before six o'clock that Monday morning. Anybody know what it was? Anybody have an idea what it was that, that, in, that left this quarry manager pulling his hair out about the cooperation between these groups of people? Anybody, any idea? They pinched the parking spaces. It's as simple as that, Pat. Yeah, it's yeah. the parking spaces. Yeah. Because Jim, the loading shovel operator, who's parked in that parking space for 30 years, <laughs> come in and some 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 lad on his loading shovel, some, some lad he, he, who's only just turned up into his, into his site, his, 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 his parking space. And, and it was the parking spaces as simple as that. And, and, and he said, like, he said it was he said, incredible. He said, he said it's something he didn't think about. So, again, as, as quarry managers, if you're going to, and, and managers, if you um, are going to bring an, an operators and, and people in quarries, you're going to bring contractors into your quarries, then you need to be thinking about things like how you're going to get the parking sorted, you know, don't make sure you upset anybody. In, and it's like thinking about the nth degree of it, if you like. So that's the, uh, the operator, if you like. And the operator also has a responsibility, though. Uh, and one of the people, uh, and, and do forgive, uh, do, uh, forgive me, uh, I think it was Fatty who said, he said it, and somebody else might have said it, uh, around about the uh, uh, in, implementing a management structure uh, into the quarry, uh, which is Regulation 8. Now, I can tell you, uh, Regulation 8 is not a very big regulation, to be fair, when you compare it to some of the other regulations in the book. However, it is one that does generate a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, confusion, if you like, even though it, it isn't, a, it isn't a, the, the biggest uh, regulation in the book. Regulation 8 in its sense, in itself, says that the operator must set up a management structure. Uh, they need to make a record of it and they need to appoint a competent individual to take charge. Um, they need to uh, nominate a substitute and then uh, appoint competent people to help manage the quarry. And that structure should be reviewed on a regular basis and everybody in the management structure appointed with a copy. It's as straightforward, it's, it's, that's regulation eight, if you like. However, when we look into some of the details that sort of uh, around the, the management structure, then it starts to get a little bit like, I, I don't know, confused, not confusing, but a little bit, I guess, you know, people I think open to a bit of interpretation and, and it really isn't, if you like, or, you know, or shouldn't be. So uh, so let's have a look at a basic management structure of a quarry uh, and, and, and an acquiring company. And what, what we're going to do is, now there are, it will change from quarry to quarry, so it's not going to exactly reflect your company that you work for, uh, you, you know, because there's such a myriad of companies out there, such a myriad of appointments, but we, what we will do is look at the real sort of important people in the, in the structure, uh, if you like. So first of all, uh, we've got at the top, we have the quarry operator. Now, the operator is, the, uh, it, it is as we said, the person who's in charge of the overall uh, quarry that we just talked about in Regulation 6. The operator can mean a person or it can mean a company. OK, so that's uh, it's a legal term, if you like, when it says person. Um, the quarry operator then has a managing director uh, appointed uh, and, and working with them. And on that managing director's board of directors, they will have someone like a quarry operations director or an aggregates director or a, 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 a an ag ops director or, or something similar to that sort of type of role. Okay. Uh, then there will be, a, a, you know, like I say, a myriad of like regional managers and, and area managers and, and people that sort of sit in between the quarry, uh, quarry ops director and, or the ag ops director and, and, and the next person. But we're sort of going to jump all those to get us down to the, to the next person, which is the quarry manager themselves. Now, we refer to the quarry manager as the 81C. Um, does anybody, uh, can anybody... Uh, be as uh, you know as, as intuitive enough to tell me why they think that we refer to the quarry manager as the eight one C. Anyone? Anybody at all? Not really with you. What are you after, Andy? Why do why do we call the quarry manager? Why do we refer to the quarry manager as the eight one C? Because that's the regulation that he's, he's, he's uh, appointed under. 
Yeah, excellent. So the regulation that the quarry manager is pointed under is Regulation 8, Paragraph 1, Section C. Uh, excellent. Thank you, uh, John. So uh, effectively, uh, paragraph, uh, sort of paragraph 1C of Regulation 8 says that the quarry operator was to appoint a competent individual to take charge of the operation of the quarry at all times when persons are working in the quarry. Provided that where the operator is an individual and is suitably qualified and competent, he may appoint himself. Now, the thing about the 81C appointment is this, okay? So these are some of the rules around it. First of all, there can only ever be one 81C per quarry, all right? So you can only appoint one 81C per quarry. The second point is that there can only be one quarry per 81C. Yeah, so, uh, so we've got, an 81C in the quarry, and we've only got one quarry per 81C. Now, I say that, but there are a few anomalies to that. So things, if there's a quarry being abandoned, uh, then you might see the 81C overlooking two quarries in that case, just overseeing one that's being sort of uh, abandoned and, 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 and sorted out for abandonment. And the other time that you might see the same 81C might be where quarries are back to back or next door to each other and things like that. But in normal circumstances, the HSE would, would only expect to see one 81C uh, per quarry. And the reason is, is the 81C needs to make themselves readily available, uh, uh, you know, and take charge of the operations at all times when people are working in the quarry. So that means that if they're overlooking two quarries, how can they be in charge if, they, they, you know, two incidents happen at the same time in both quarries, but, you, you, you know, they might be 10 miles apart, 20 miles apart. That's gonna, you know, which one does the 81C take charge of? So that's uh, the, 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 the 81C appointment. However, as you're uh, absolutely aware, that the 81C or the quarry manager will need holidays, there'll be sickness and things like that. So the quarry manager would need to have time off. So we need to put something in place uh, to help support that, to, to help do that. And therefore, we go into the next uh, person down. So the next person down is a nomination, which is slightly different to a to uh, absolutely appointed in writing, uh, because the, the quarry manager needs to be appointed in writing. The site supervisor or the assistant manager can be a nomination. Okay, so it doesn't have to be appointed in writing. You tend to find most of them are, to be fair, appointed in writing, but they don't have to be. Um, and this is the 81D. Now, the 81D is different to the 81C insofar as saying that the at the 81D, you can have more than one 81D on site. So there can be more than one 81D. Uh, also, uh, an 81D can be an 81D or an assistant manager or, or, or a site supervisor of more than one site. So you can have more, more 81Ds per site and an 81D can have more sites. Now the 81D says, uh, the, 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 the sort of regulation says about the 81D is to, uh, the, the, to ensure that for whatever reason, the individual appointed in accordance with paragraph 1C is not readily available, a competent individual is nominated as a substitute to hold the authority and perform the duties of the first name individual. Now, the thing about the 81D is this, is that that 81D needs to be competent for the role that they're doing. So if you've got an 81D who is taking charge of the site, and doing what the quarry manager needs to do, then really they need to have the, the, the same sort of qualifications as you'd expect as a minimum for that quarry manager to prove their competency. So uh, normally, uh, you know, in, in normally things like a VQ uh, level four. Now you might find that what we do find is quarry managers tend to go up to like level sixes on the VQs, but and the system managers level four. Now that is acceptable because they meet a minimum standard requirement. They don't need to meet the same. The, 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 the same level as a quarry manager, but they need to make sure that they've got that minimum of, uh, requirement of being able to take charge of that quarry and, 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 and make sure that they can do the duties of that person. Now, there is another anomaly around the 81Ds is this, is that if you've got a asphalt plant on site or you have a maintenance crew that are coming in at the weekend, uh, as the regulations have I just explained them there to you, uh, it would need to have an 81D on site to oversee the maintenance crew or to make sure that the asphalt plant and, and you know, sitting in an office, maybe babysitting it 
So what we uh, what what you can do in that instance is you can appoint an 81D with limited responsibility or WLR as as we refer to it. So this means that the 81 uh, the activities that are taking place whilst that 81D is in charge on site that are only the activities that they have got uh, you know the the uh, competencies to oversee the responsibilities to oversee. Now so for instance if you've got an asphalt plant operating you might make your asphalt plant bat batcher an 81D with limited responsibility however the only jobs that can be carried out will be asphalt plant batching uh, uh, underneath that person's supervision if they're the person in charge of the, uh, that day if they're the 81D in charge. Now now there is another thing to say here is that if you have a whole load of 81Ds on site you also need to make sure that you've got a structure in place or a hierarchy of command amongst those 81Ds so that everybody knows who the 81D in charge is. You can't split the quarry up into the different parts and say, well, we're just going to give that 81D that responsibility and that one 81D that responsibility and give them all equal shares of, of responsibility because the quarry manager isn't there. There needs to be one that, over, that takes over from the quarry manager and takes charge of everything. All right. So there's our 81D appointment. Um, do stop me, by the way, if, if you do have any questions. Uh, I, I am conscious that I'm going to keep you running, so I'll, I'll keep moving with it. Um, so underneath the 81D uh, nomination, uh, you have your operatives and your craftsmen. Um, there is another uh, uh, appointment, uh, and this is the 81E. Now, this one here is one that causes a lot of confusion, although it shouldn't. Uh, it does, and, 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 and I see even major companies getting this one that, 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 you know, wrong and, and, and making mistakes on this one. So 81E appointment is, and, and let me just read what the 81E appointment says. It says to ensure that a sufficient number of competent persons are appointed to manage the quarry safely. Now, an 81E appointment is not a, a substitute for an 81D. An 81E is not the next level down. An 81E appointment is somebody with specialist knowledge to help that quarry run safely. Now, the best way of explaining that, that is, is if you've got a, a quarry manager, you cannot expect the quarry manager to be um, to, to be a, a, the be all and end all in, in electrical safety. It's because they won't have that. They might not necessarily have that competencies and qualifications. So what they need is an 81E appointment of somebody with that specialist knowledge who can help them run that quarry safely. OK, so it's not a, 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 a um, it's not a. Uh, a, a, a sort of substitute to an 81D, um, if you like. Then, uh, as we come out, there are other appointments uh, from the from the quarry manager. So this would be your explosive supervisor. Now they're appointed under another regulation in the book. They're regulation 25, uh, and the explosive supervisor can be one of many people as long as they've got the right competencies to do the job. It can be a contractor that you bring in. So some contractors will, uh, you know, supply that with with their um, with their uh, you know contract, if you like. It can be uh, the quarry manager themselves. Again, as long as they've got the right competencies to do the job, uh, or it could be somebody else in the quarry that you've got uh, appointed as a, as the explosive supervisor under Regulation Twenty Five One B. Now, the explosive supervisor needs to take a, a quite a stringent exam. Uh, to become an explosive supervisor. It's by no means a gimme. Uh, it's not something I ever tell explosive supervisors that I know their exam is quite tough, but I do know it's quite tough. Uh, and it is quite a, is, you know, quite, a, quite a hard exam to take. So, uh, so they sit within your drilling and blasting team, whether you bring them in as a contractor or whether you've got them in house, but you have your shop fires and your drillers that sort of come underneath your explosive supervisor as well. Then, uh, then we look at things like we go externally outside the quarry floor. Now, when we talk about external resources, these could be uh, resources that you've uh, got from, um, you know, in-house. And so some people do certainly work in-house. And I think Stephen uh, quite rightly said that he was he's done both for a company and as a contractor uh, as a geotechnical specialist. So a geotechnical specialist can be in-house or they can it can be external. 
Uh, your health and safety team, your health and safety team, again, their advisors, they could be in-house or external. The next two, your health surveillance and health monitoring, well, in all essence, they are, uh, you know, nine times out of 10, or, or most cases that I know, they, they, they are external. So your health surveillance is when you go into the little white van and they uh, and, and they do all the little stuff with you, the blood pressures and things like that, or they put the uh, the headphones on you and they ask you to listen to the beeping noise, and, but they always park the little white van next to where the truck's reversed as well. So you've got beeping noises going off everywhere. Uh, so that's uh, your health phones and health monitoring is things like your, your, your things like dust and noise monitoring and things like that. And so there's uh, pretty much regulation uh, eight, if you like. Now, it is important that the management structure should always make it clear where responsibilities lie and that everybody in the management structure knows their level of authority and responsibility. So, uh, so that is the management structure, if you like. Um, so I, I guess my uh, question is, um, is, and I've just seen, I do apologize to a couple of people because I've just seen the chat box light up in front of me there with your, with your responses. Uh, so Chris, Roderick and uh, Fatty, sorry uh, uh, about ignoring your, uh, your, your chat there, I do, do apologize. Um, yeah, so my, my next uh, thing is, is uh, I, I guess, is to ask you if you have any questions on uh, what we've uh, what we've covered, or if, if there are any questions that anybody's got, <laughs> sort of, sort of um, is it fair enough? Okay. Andy. Well, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Go on. Hi, Fatih here. Uh, I'm I'm a bit new to uh, the the country, so I'll um, I'll ask this. So when we're talking about a um, competent person for quarry manager uh, as per regulation eight, or the engineer uh, as the the was it the E eight um, one uh, E. Uh, or do 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 you have ticketing system in the UK? Do do people like where where how how is the competency measured in the country? How do you deem someone competent? Is there a certain ticket, the quarry manager's ticket, like Australia? You know, like you get one, or how does it work here? Okay, excellent. Uh, cheers, uh, Fatih. That's a that's a really great question, and I'm and I'm glad you've asked it because I can help answer part of it and. Uh, uh, and, uh, and a friend of mine, Pat Bowles, can help you answer part of it as well. So <laughs> any bits that I miss, I'm sure Pat can come in and, and fill me in uh, with. So competency is measured in, in quarrying uh, over people at, obtaining something called the National Occupational Standards. Now, they're normally measured in things like uh, VQs or vocational qualifications. Uh, so that means that people coming out uh, to site to, uh, to assess you, uh, to a level and, uh, and 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 assess your sort of knowledge and your skills uh, to make sure that you you're meeting the right competencies as set out in the national occupational standards. Now, uh, so so that would uh, certainly be a, a measure of competence. Now, there would certainly need to be, I guess, some element of training in there. Uh, to make sure that you're familiar with things like the regulations and, and stuff like that. However, the the, the I. I mean, from a training company, I shouldn't really say this, but I don't think the element of training is that that's, although it will help maybe define your competence, it's not the, 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 the critical measure, if that, if that makes sense. And I'll hand over to Pat to sort of explain that, mm -hmm. because you'd be much better than me, won't you, Pat? I think you pretty much covered it, Andy. Um, as I say, in the regulations, uh, Obviously, the competence, as we see it, is, is defined by the VQ. And as Andy mentions, the National Occupational Standards. But if you do have a knock on the door from an inspector and you can prove otherwise that you have, you have met all those standards, then you've done as much as you can. So um, probably not the answer you're looking for, but um, and it's, it's very, very vague. But uh, start with the National Occupational Standards and, and the, you can log on and see the VQs and what the VQs... Um, what units the, the qualifications contain, um, as I say, and, and, and by all means, give us a bell later and we can have a chat. Yeah, and, and, and thanks, Pat. And that would be yeah, definitely something to do, Fatty, is, is by contact us and we can help talk you through what 
sort of minimum VQ that we that the HSE would normally sort of uh, be plumping for, or what VQ you, you need to get. Uh, I hope that helped you. Question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but uh, then uh, maybe after we finish this, I'll get some. Uh, if you can, maybe type your contact details in the chat, or yeah, no, if no. I can get them. Yeah, there's something uh, come up. I'll put another slide up in a minute after I've been through a summary, and, and you can grab them from there, mate. All right. So thank you. No worries, Matty. Cheers. Thank you. Um, right. Okay. Somebody else. I'm muted there. John. Hi, John. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, very interesting. I've got to shoot off now, mate. I'll go and pick the nipper up, mate. So. Uh, right, okay. Uh, thank you very much. And actually. Uh, I've got to be honest, it clarified the 8-1-E issue for me. So, uh, right, okay, excellent. Well, good, John. And uh, how old's your nipper, mate? Nine and a half, mate, going on 15. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, thanks a lot. Good to see everybody as well. So see you all soon. Yeah, John, all the best, Cheers, mate. Guys. Thank Take you. care. Thank you. Bye, John. Thank you. Um, any, any other questions at all? Any questions? Right. Okay, then uh, I am conscious that I am eating into, you know, over time now. So um, first of all, uh, just in summary, as I said, regulations, uh, they have evolved over time uh, from one of the oldest occupations in the world uh, and that we are all, uh, you know, really uh, lucky to be part of, uh, you might think, sometimes on a Friday afternoon. Um, the, the operator is uh, the person who's overall control of the quarry. Uh, their key and distinctive duty is to manage the health and safety for the whole site, including uh, contractors and, and, and visitors and the general public. Uh, the cooperator may be a person or company, as, as we said, uh, and most of the duties in the regulations actually fall on the operator, to, uh, if you like. And uh, the management structure, we've had a look at the management structure. There must be an 81C in place. 81Ds, uh, what 81Ds do, they, they sort of support the 81C and they can cover for an 81C. However, 81Es are the, are, are the, are the confusion. Uh, don't let them confuse you. You know, you're, you're better at not appoint them rather than people thinking that they need to appoint an 81E uh, for whatever reason. You just make your 81Es, 81Ds, if you're just appointing them as substitute 81Ds, you just make sure that they're in the in the structure is what they are as what they are uh, however the management structure must make it clear where responsibilities lie um, if anybody would and this is the shameless plug bit if anybody uh, would like any uh, further information on a wide range of uh, qualifications and courses then you can contact us here at MP skills uh, so email is info at mpskills.co.uk uh, telephone number 0 Double one five nine eight three five seven five five. Uh, if anybody would like to contact me directly, then it's the same email address, but instead of info, it's Andy Cox with an X. 